Section 16 of A Daughter of the Sioux. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mary Rohde. A Daughter of the Sioux by General Charles King. Chapter 16. Night Prowling at Frayn. In the full of the September moon, the war bands of the Sioux defied agents and peace chiefs, commissioners and soldiers, and started their wild campaign in northern Wyoming. In the full of the October moon, the big chief of the whites had swept the last vestige of their warriors from the plains, and followed their bloody trails into the heart of the mountains all his cavalry and much of his foot force being needed for the work in hand not until november therefore when the ice bridge spanned the still reaches of the platte and the snow lay deep in the breaks and coolies did the foremost of the homeward-bound commands come in view of old fort frayne and meantime very remarkable things had occurred and it was to a very different if only temporary post commander that sandy ray reported them as sighted even brave old dade had been summoned to the front with all his men and in their place had come from distant posts in kansas other troops to occupy the vacant quarters and strive to feel at home in strange surroundings a man of austere mould was the new major one of the old covenanter type who would march to battle shouting hymn tunes and to christmas and thanksgiving chanting doleful lays he hailed indeed from old puritan stock had been a pillar in the village church in days before the great war and emulated stonewall jackson in his piety if he did not in martial prowess backed by local and by no means secular influences he had risen in the course of the four years war from a junior lieutenancy to the grade of second in command of his far eastern regiment had rendered faithful services in command of convalescent camps and the like but developed none of that vain ambition which prompts the seeking of the bubble reputation at the cannon's mouth all he ever knew of southern men in antebellum days was what he heard from the lips of inspired orators or read from the pens of very earnest anti-slavery editors through lack of opportunity he had met no southerner before the war and carried his stanch calvinistic prejudices to such extent that he seemed to shrink from closer contact even then the war was holy the hand of the lord would surely smite the slave-holding arch-rebel which was perhaps why the covenanter thought it work of supererogation to raise his own he finished as he began the war in an unalterable conviction that the southern president his cabinet and all his leading officers should be hung and their lands confiscated to the state or its representatives he had been given a commission in the army when such things were not hard to get at the reorganization in sixty six had been stationed in a ku klux district all one winter and in a sanitarium most of the year that followed he thought the nation on the high road to hell when it failed to impeach the president of high crimes and misdemeanors and sent hancock to harmonize matters in louisiana he was sure of it when the son of a southerner who had openly flouted him was sent to west point he retained these radical views even unto the twentieth anniversary of the great surrender and while devoutly praying for forgiveness of his own sins could never seem to forgive those whose lot had been cast with the south he was utterly nonplussed when told that the young officer languishing in hospital on his arrival was the son of a distinguished major-general of the confederate army and he planned for the father a most frigid greeting until reminded that the former major-general was now a member of congress and of the committee on military affairs 
Then it became his duty to overlook the past. He had not entered Field's little room even when inspecting hospital. Flint was forever inspecting something or other. The doctor's assurance that, though feeble, his patient was doing quite well, was all sufficient. He had thought to greet the former confederate, a sorely anxious father, with grave and distant civility, as an avowed and doubtless unregenerate enemy of that sacred flag. But, as has been said, that was before it was pointed out to him that this was the Honorable M. C. from the Pelican State, now prominent as a member of the House Committee on Military Affairs. Motherless and sisterless was the wounded boy, yet gentle and almost caressing hands had blessed his pillow and helped to drive fever and delirium to the winds. It was twelve days after they brought him back to Frayne, before the father could hope to reach him, coming post-haste, too. But by that time the lad was propped on his pillows, weak, sorrowing, and sorely troubled, none the less so because there was no one now to whom he could say why. The men whom he knew and trusted were all away on campaign, all save the veteran post-surgeon, whom hitherto he had felt he hardly knew at all. The women, whom he had best known and trusted, were still present at the post. Mrs. Ray and Mrs. Blake had been his friends, frank, cordial, and sincere up to the week of his return from Laramie, and his sudden and overwhelming infatuation for Nanette Flower. Then they had seemed to hold aloof, to greet him only with courtesy, and to eye him with unspoken reproach. The woman at Fort Frayne, to whom he most looked up, was Mrs. Dade, and now Mrs. Dade seemed alienated utterly. She had been to inquire for him frequently, said his attendant, when he was so racked with fever. So had others, and they sent him now jellies and similar delicacies, but came no more in person just yet, at least, but he did not know the doctor so desired. Field knew that his father, after the long, long journey from the distant south, was now close at hand, would be with him within a few hours, and even with Ray's warm words of praise still ringing in his ears, the young soldier was looking to that father's coming almost with distress. It was through God's mercy and the wisdom of the old surgeon that no word as yet had been whispered to him of the discovery made when the money packages were opened, of the tragic fate that had, possibly, befallen Bill Hay and Miss Flower. That a large sum of money was missing, and that Field was the accountable officer, was already whispered about the garrison. The fact that four officers and Mr. Hay were aware of it in the first place, and the latter had told it to his wife, was fatal to entire secrecy. But in the horror and excitement that prevailed when the details of the later tragedy were noised about the post, this minor incident had been almost forgotten. The disappearance of Hay and his brilliant, beautiful niece, however, was not to be forgotten for a moment day or night, despite the fact that Mrs. Hay, who had been almost crazed with dread and terror when first informed there had been a hold-up, rallied almost immediately and took heart and hope when it became apparent that Indians, not white men, were the captors. "'The Sioux would never harm a hair of his head,' she proudly declared. "'He has been their friend for half a century.' nor had she fears for Nanette. The Sioux would harm nobody her husband sought to protect. When it was pointed out to her that they had harmed the guards, that one of them was found shot dead and scalped at the shores of the Platte, and the other, poor fellow, had crawled off among the rocks and bled to death within gunshot of the scene, Mrs. Hay said they must have first shown fight and shot some of the Sioux, for all the Indians knew Mr. Hay's wagon. Then why, asked Fort Frayne, had they molested him and his? The general had had to leave for the front without seeing Mrs. Hay, 
more than ever was it necessary that he should be afield for this exploit showed that some of the sioux at least had cut loose from the main body and had circled back toward the platte stabbers people in all probability so sending crab and his little squad across the river to follow a few miles at least the trail of the wagon and its captors and ascertain if possible whither it had gone he hurried back to frayne sent messengers by the laramie road to speed the cavalry and orders to the colonel to send two troops at once to rescue hay and his niece sent wires calling for a few reinforcements and was off on the way to beecher guarded by a handful of sturdy doughboys in ambulances before ever the body of the second victim was found and then little by little it transpired that this mysterious war party venturing to the south bank of the platte did not exceed half a dozen braves crab got back in thirty-six hours with five exhausted men they had followed the wheel tracks over the open prairie and into the foothills far to the northwest emboldened by the evidence of there being but few ponies in the original bandit escort but by four in the afternoon they got among the brakes and ravines and first thing they knew among the indians for zip came the bullets and down went two horses and they had to dismount and fight to stand off possible swarms and though owning they had seen no indians they had proof of having felt them and were warranted in pushing no further after dark they began their slow retreat and here they were and for seven days that was the last heard by the garrison at least of these most recent captives of the sioux gentle and sympathetic women however who called on mrs hay were prompt to note that though unnerved unstrung distressed she declared again and again her faith that the indians would never really harm her husband they might hold him and nanette as hostages for ransom they might take for their own purposes his wagon his mules and that store of money but his life was safe yes and nanette's too of this she was so confident that people began to wonder whether she had not received some assurance to that effect and when pete the stable-boy driver turned up at the end of the first week with the cock-and-bull story about having stolen an indian pony and shot his way from the midst of the sioux away up on no wood creek on the west side of the hills and having ridden by night and hidden by day until he got back to the platte and frayne people felt sure of it pete could talk sioux better than he could jabber english he declared the indians were in the hills by thousands and were going to take hay and the young lady away off somewhere to be held for safe keeping he said the two troops that never even halting at frayne had pushed out on the trail would only get into trouble if they tried to enter the hills from the south and that they would never get the captives wherein pete was right for away out among the spurs and gorges of the range fifty miles from frayne the pursuers came upon the wreck of the wagon at the foot of an acclivity up which a force of sioux had gone in single file many warriors it would seem however must have joined the party on the way and from here where with the wagon was found hay's stout box bereft of its contents in four different directions the pony tracks of little parties crossed or climbed the spurs and which way the captives had been taken captain billings the commander could not determine what the Sioux hoped he might do was divide his force into four detachments and send one on each trail. Then they could fall upon them one by one and slay them at their leisure. Billings saw the game, however, and was not to be caught. He knew Bill Hay, his past and his popularity among the red men. He knew that if they meant to kill him at all, they would not have taken the trouble to cart him fifty miles beforehand. He dropped the stern chase then and there, and on the following day skirted the foothills away to the east, 
and circling round to the breaks of the powder as he reached the open country struck and hard hit a scouting band of sioux and joined the general three days later when most he was needed near the log palisades of old fort beecher then there had been more or less of mysterious coming and going among the half-breed hangers-on about the trader's store and these were things the new post commander knew not how to interpret even when informed of them he saw mrs hay but once or twice he moved into the quarters of major webb possessing himself until his own should arrive of such of the major's belongings as the vigilance of mistress mcgann would suffer he stationed big guards from his two small companies about the post and started more hard swearing among his own men for getting only two nights in bed than had been heard at frayne in long months of less pious post commandership he strove to make himself agreeable to the ladies left lamenting for their lords but as luck would have it fell foremost into the clutches of the quartermaster's wife the dominant and unterrified wilkins just what prompted that energetic and in many ways estimable woman to take the new major into close communion and tell him not only what she knew but what she thought about all manner of matters at the post can never be justly determined but within the first few days of his coming and on the eve of the arrival of general field major flint was in possession of the story of how devoted young field had been to esther dade and how cruelly he had jilted her for the brilliant miss flower her that was gone with the sioux the differences between her stout veteran liege and the smooth-faced stripling had given her text to start with the story of the money lost had filtered from her lips and finally that of the other peccadilloes attributable to the young post adjutant whom as she said the major had to reduce and send to the front all long of his doings in garrison dade was gone there was no man save wilkins to whom major flint felt he could appeal for confirmation or denial of these stories dr waller was his senior in the service by ten years at least and a type of the old-time officer and gentleman of whom such as flint stood ever in awe he preferred therefore as he thought to keep the doctor at a distance to make him feel the immensity of his the post commander's station and so as wilkins dare not disavow the sayings of his wife even had he been so minded the story stood flint was thinking of them this very evening when dr waller happening to meet him on his way from hospital briefly said that general field should be with them on the morrow he leaves rock creek to-night having hired transportation there i had hoped our lad might be in better spirits by this time the major answered vaguely how could a lad with all these sins upon his soul be in anything but low spirits here was a brand to be snatched from the burning a youth whom prompt stern measures might redeem and restore one who should be taught the error of his ways forthwith only the coming of the member of the military committee of the house of representatives might make the process embarrassing there were other ways therefore and however in which this valuable information in the major's possession might be put to use and of these was the major thinking more than of the condition of the wounded lad physical or spiritual as homeward through the gloaming he wended his way might it not be well to wait until this important and influential personage had reached the post before proceeding further might it not be well confidentially and gradually as it were to permit the hon m c to know that grave irregularities had occurred that up to this moment the complete knowledge thereof was locked in the breast of the present post commander that the suppression or presentation of the facts depended solely upon that post commander 
and then if the member of the house committee on military affairs proved receptive appreciative in fact responsive might not the ends of justice better be subserved by leaving to the parent the duty of personally and privately correcting the son and in consideration of the post commander's wisdom and continence pledging the influence of the military committee to certain delectable ends in the major's behalf long had flint had his eye on a certain desirable berth in the distant east at the national capital in fact but never yet had he found statesman or soldier inclined to further his desire that night the major bade mr and mrs wilkins hold their peace as to fields peccadilloes until further leave was given them to speak that night the major calling at captain dade's was concerned to hear that mrs dade was not at home gone over to the hospital with mrs blake and the doctor was the explanation and these gentle-hearted women it seems were striving to do something to rouse the lad from the slough of despond which had engulfed him that night pink marble hay's faithful bookkeeper and clerk for many a year a one-armed veteran of the civil war calling as was his invariable custom when the trader was absent to leave the keys of the safe and desks with mrs hay was surprised to find her in a flood of tears for which she declined all explanation yet the sight of pete the half-breed slouching away toward the stables as marble closed the gate more than suggested cause for pink had long disapproved of that young man that night crapaud the other stableman had scandalized jerry sullivan the barkeeper and old mcgann webb's hibernian major-domo by interrupting their game of old sledge with a demand for a quart of whiskey on top of all that he had obviously and surreptitiously been drinking and by further indulging in furious threats in a sputtering mixture of dakota french and french dakota when summarily kicked out that night late as twelve o'clock mrs ray aroused by the infantile demands of the fourth of the olive branches and further disturbed by the suspicious growlings and challenge of old tonto blake's veteran mastiff peeped from the second-story window and plainly saw two forms in soldier overcoats at the back fence and wondered what the sentries found about blake's quarters to require so much attention then she became aware of a third form rifle-bearing and slowly pacing the curving line of the bluff the sentry beyond doubt who then were these others who had now totally disappeared she thought to speak of it to nanny in the morning and then thought not there were reasons why nervous alarm of any kind were best averted then from mrs blake but there came reasons speedily why mrs ray could not forget it and that night later still along toward four o'clock the persistent clicking of the telegraph instrument at the adjutant's office caught the ear of the sentry who in time stirred up the operator and a rush message was later thrust into the hand of major flint demolishing a day-old castle in the air from rock creek wyoming october twenty three eighteen eighty blank nine fifteen p m commanding officer fort frayne via fort laramie stage capsized crook cannon general field seriously injured have wired omaha signed warner commanding camp end of chapter sixteen